can't really control the fluctuations in the market. You can control your reactions to them. So I, in this particular case, my, my view on, on Bitcoin is the reason to do it is because it represents freedom and sovereignty, truth, integrity, and hope for the world. And that being the case, it's going to outlast all of us. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking that Bitcoin goes on long after MicroStrategy is gone and MicroStrategy, the company probably goes on long after I'm gone. My view is if we're remembered for advocating and accelerating the adoption of Bitcoin throughout the world, then that will have been success and I don't need anything else. It's amazing. And no. I'll, take the, I'll take the beatings as they come or go in order to get to that end goal because I'm sure it doesn't come without turbulence. Over the next decade, Bitcoin will undergo a revolutionary transformation, transcending short-term market fluctuations that fail to reflect its true value. Michael Saylor's latest message emphasizes Bitcoin's essence as a symbol of freedom, sovereignty, truth, integrity, and hope for the world, destined to endure beyond our lifetimes. In his recent interview, Saylor provides an insightful perspective on Bitcoin, extending beyond its role as a currency. He outlines a compelling narrative of Bitcoin's trajectory which commenced with the introduction of ETFs in January 2024, ushering in a decade of unparalleled growth until 2034. As we approach the milestone of mining 99% of all Bitcoins, Bitcoin will cement its place as a permanent fixture in global finance. Saylor fervently believes in Bitcoin's enduring legacy, offering perpetual hope and freedom long after our time has passed. Ever feel like you're wasting your money on things that don't really matter? Stop. You don't have time. Don't miss out on this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself now. Don't spend $12.50 on junk. Educate yourself on how to be successful in crypto using our crypto cheat guide. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Visit the website now on the link in the description for your exclusive copy. Start your journey to crypto success today. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to drop your comment and observations in the comment section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. I think 2020 to 2024 was, you know, the high volatility, high uncertainty. It's like that early stage of institutional adoption. But really, we start mainstream institutional adoption. I would date it to January 2024 with the approval of the ETFs, the spot ETFs. And I think it runs, we have about a 10-year gold rush. It runs to 2034 November. Between 2024 and 2034, we will uh, have mined 99% of all the Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin becomes, for all practical purposes, fixed by November of 2024. The last 1% comes out over 100 years. Okay, so we, we, uh, we have this 42 quarter period where at the beginning of the period... What percentage are we at now? Right now we're like uh, 94%. Oh. So if you, you got, you, you've got, you, you think it's not much, but I mean, 5% is a lot <laughs> over 10 years compared to 1% over 100 years. So there's actually still Bitcoin available for sale right now. The miners have to sell it. So at the beginning of this period in Q1, we're in Q1 now, if you go to January 1st, no institution could buy it even if they wanted to. It just wasn't on their radar. And... Um, so you really have 42 quarters of people learning what it is, studying it. It takes 10 hours to scratch the surface, and it takes 100 hours before you get a degree of comfort. Most people, you know, once they get past the age of 40, they don't want to spend 100 hours learning a new thing. It's, it's very rare. So you've got Wall Street firms spinning up massive education apparatus. You, you've got a whole set of stages of adoption. First, can I buy it? Then is it on uh, the approved list for solicited sale? Then is it on the approved list for unsolicited sale? Is it marginable? Can I borrow against it? Is it optionable? Can I hedge it? Is it recommended? Is it structural? Is it built into a fund? That's like seven layers of adoption. People take a year to think about each of those layers. There's a uh, hundred powerful entities that control huge amounts of money that will go through that in the Western world. So I think we're in this, this institutional education stage. And um, 
In 2034, it'll simply be the new thing. Right now, it's like it's like the scary, exotic thing for most people. Well, I think that uh, the biggest challenge of Bitcoin is that the industry refers to it as a cryptocurrency, and oftentimes people refer to it as a digital currency. And there's a very vocal, uh, a vocal contingent that wants it to be a currency. And, um, and the rest of the world doesn't really understand money. So if you say to someone, what do you think about Bitcoin as digital currency? They say, well, I think it threatens the dollar, I hate it. If you said, what do you think about Bitcoin as digital property? You know, I'm gonna buy it instead of buying a building in Des Moines. I'm like, oh, how about it? If you, if you simply conceptualize it as property, or, which is store of value, all of the objections, all of the straw man objections, like, it's used but for money laundering, it's, it's, not, it's not legal tender, I can't buy coffee with it, it's not fast enough, it's not private. All of these things disappear because it's about as stupid as saying to Bob Kraft, you can't buy a cup of coffee with the New England Patriots by breaking off some, you know, one of your tight ends. And you can't buy a cup of coffee with your building in Boston. You know, so of course I can't. You can't buy a cup of coffee with part of a Picasso in the lower left corner, right? But, but you know, wealthy people have been using them as a store of value and as money for 500 years. Everybody looks at Bitcoin and they think, well, how do I create the next Cash App or the next mobile app or the next Fidelity or the next Coinbase or the next whatever? And they, they think really hard about that or, or how, do I, how do I topple JP Morgan? It's like, that's a very difficult thing to do. I give you a very simple idea. You have a treasury in your company. Uh, if you put your treasury into sovereign debt, you're gonna yield 5% pre-tax, 3% after tax, and you're not gonna beat the cost of capital. The cost of capital right now is eight to 10% in the US, easy. So if that's the case, your treasury is a liability, which means that any rational person would look at you and say you should decapitalize, you should give all, you should run on the minimum working capital or negative working capital, and you should run on debt. But I'll give you another idea. If you actually are investing in something you expect to go up 20 to 40 percent a year for the next decade, you're beating the cost of capital by a factor of two. That means the right thing to do is go back to your venture capitalist or your bank and just raise hundred million dollars that you don't need, and buy Bitcoin with it. Because if, if the business you're running doesn't work, you will have a business that's growing 20 to 30% a year, scalably, for the next 30 years. That will work, right? You'll double the 100 million two times in the next six years. So it will be 200, 400 million. In six years, when the thing that you're doing right now doesn't work, you're gonna have a business that's growing 20% a year off a $400 million base, which is a monopoly. So most, I think, the number one, I mean, this is a simple hack, but every venture capitalist in the world is getting two and 20. They're gonna get a 2% management fee and a 20% participation. And their mandate is they have to invest in operating businesses that are private. And if they were to go and buy a billion dollars of Bitcoin with limited partner capital, their limited partners would say, are you crazy? I could have bought Bitcoin. So the VC can't buy Bitcoin, which is the risk-free return of 20, 30% a year. The VC can give you the $100 million. You can buy the Bitcoin. They end up with debt in a private company. You end up with a uh, hundred, two hundred, five hundred million dollar business growing 20, 30 percent a year that's scalable that you run with yourself and your CFO. It's good for them. They're going to make a fortune. They they want to invest the money. The real problem in the world, and, and by the way, this is back to the Dow of Steve. In the Dow of Steve, there's a guy sitting on the bed and he's smoking marijuana, and, and someone's saying, "Well, you know, like." Why aren't you out there doing something? He says, doing stuff is highly overrated. <laughs> okay? So here's the big idea, which is, there's a couple hundred trillion dollars of capital in the world that's debasing at 10% a year right now. And the big idea is just stop investing in toxic money, right? Michael Saylor emphasizes the true value of Bitcoin, transcending mere market fluctuations. His perspective on Bitcoin extends well beyond its financial implications, viewing it as a symbol of freedom, truth, 
and integrity. Saylor envisions a future where Bitcoin not only endures but flourishes, serving as a testament to these core principles, surpassing the lifespan of companies and individuals alike. According to Saylor, we are amidst the Bitcoin gold rush catalyzed by the acceptance of Bitcoin ETFs. This golden era, spanning from 2024 to 2034, presents an optimal window for acquiring Bitcoin before its finite supply diminishes. Beyond financial gains, this period signifies a transformative shift in how we perceive and integrate this remarkably successful asset into our lives. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.